Welcome back to episode 26 of the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. And tonight we bring you with a comparison point to last week's uh, big 25th episode, or at least for us it was, uh, for Rio Bravo. We come this week with High Noon. So this was a movie that you had suggested after last week, uh, given how um, Rio Bravo, specifically by Hawks and the Duke, um, John Wayne, had made that movie, uh, or at least have notably said they made that movie in contrast uh, to this one. So you wanted to do a compare and contrast, but uh, let's take it from our normal uh, starting point. And what is your connection to this movie? It's a film that I uh, had always heard about and had not seen until, oh boy, not that long ago, maybe five, six years ago. I had never seen, maybe I'd seen bits and pieces of it, but I had never seen the full film until then. Um, in fact, this is one of the, I think I've only seen it one other time, or the first time I saw it, and maybe one other time since we watched it again this week preparing for this uh, taping. So it is a highly notable film. It's on a lot of people's, um, you know, like best all time movies list. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've mentioned it possibly on the podcast before that uh, I've been trying to do this movie project for about five years to watch every uh, best picture winner and every AFI top 100 on both the 1998 and uh, 2007 list. And this is one of those that has appeared on both AFI lists where I'm kind of burying the lead a little bit um, with that already. But that being said, um, I think the first time I watched this was in the last two years, and I'm pretty sure you've watched it both times with me. Um, I think this is one we watched together a couple of years ago. You and I watched it the other day uh, together again. And um, it's one that... Um, seems like it should be longer and that there should be more going on, but is kind of a very simple premise and um, has a lot of build with a kind of climactic um, famous sequence, but not a lot in between. Uh, most of it has to do with a lot of dialogue and moral discussion uh, going on within the, the realm of the movie. And it was kind of... Um, anti-western that it didn't have more um action sequences didn't have more um you know chase scenes anything of that nature there was there's really only the gunfight at the end um and the rest of it is the build-up toward that so uh i will dive into this so the basic plot summary Former Marshal Will Kane, played by Gary Cooper, is preparing to leave the small town of Hadleyville, New Mexico, with his new bride, Amy, played by Grace Kelly, when he learns that local criminal Frank Miller has been set free and is coming to seek revenge on the Marshal who turned him in. When he starts recruiting deputies to fight Miller, Kane is discouraged to find that the people of Hadleyville turn cowardly when the time comes for a showdown, and he must face Miller and his cronies alone. I mean, to a certain extent, that entire plot summary has um, basically covered the first hour of the movie, and this is an only an hour and 24-minute movie. Correct. And the interesting thing is, is I don't know if you noticed it, but it's a movie that's in real time. Yes. The, the event is supposed to happen at high noon when the train arrives, and he gets notification for it about an hour and 20 minutes before it happens. Right. And so from 20 minutes to 11 until noon, you see him going through the preparation of getting to uh, or getting prepared for the contest that will happen at or after high noon. It, so it's actually a keen way of doing it. I thought it was kind of uh, unique because I don't know if I've ever seen a movie where the entire thing is in real time. So it, it does remind me more of the, uh, because we're in a more modern sense, but uh, the way they used to do the TV show 24 and so that everything else was in, in real time in that. But um, this is the first one that I know of, at least from a movie standpoint, that really uh, puts together that device. 
And the other or other notable thing um, about the movie is how uh, present in a lot of the framing of certain shots clocks are. It's in the background and you can constantly see them almost everywhere you go in town. Every time you have a major scene change, it's visible over somebody's shoulder or um, it's just off uh, of center or uh, something else that's going on. And you get this um, impending doom sort of pressure that builds and builds and builds until its ultimate conclusion. And I think as far as um, stealing my own thunder, I think it's a wonderful use of um, set spacing and camera work to incorporate all of those things as not only a visual, but um, a emotional sense with how they're doing it. It does. Um, the, there are very few um, directors that I really think highlight or are able to use camera work uh, or cinematographers even um, to their advantage to really um, create a um, emotional sense or the, the right type of emotional reaction from the audience. But in this case, this one really worked for me. I, I, yeah, I agree that there was a certain element of that. And then the use of the, of the camera and the shot, it's a much more visual movie than it is a, uh, a, a, uh, um, a movie with dialogue. It's in some ways Hitchcock did most of his visually. And a lot of times the lines were just meant to get from one visual to the next. And in this case, there's a lot of time that's spent with just the background noise or the, the background music from Dimitri Tompkin um, that uh, fills it in. It's just, Gary Cooper walking through town, Gary Cooper going to this location, you know, et cetera. And there's a lot of, uh, of silent moments in the film that convey the mood and the atmosphere uh, as much as anything. So I'm going to, I'm sorry, I didn't get that sense at all. I think this is a dialogue heavy movie. And the dialogue is what really um, puts this uh, in another category because the only way uh, you were going to get um, certain moralities from this movie that you really wanted to because, and I again, I'm kind of stealing my own thunder as to um, how I'm going to uh, talk about or what is this movie about. But ultimately, you don't get the same allegory um, of the guy standing up for the lost cause without all of the dialogue in between. And most of this movie for me was not um, background or him doing certain things or him just riding a horse or whatever else. It's the dialogue in between characters and how they relate to each other and everybody's uh, how they approach the event that's going to be happening in an hour. Well, an hour and twenty minutes. They 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 got an actor to play the part. This is, of course, after John Wayne turned it down and Montgomery Cliff turned it down. Oh, but, I was not aware of that, but okay. Um, but again, this is a situation where they got an actor who's notoriously uh, silent a lot of the time. He he didn't speak much and and kind of almost struggle to say lines at times by his just yes. general nature and that they played that up it, you i don't think you really paid attention yes there's dialogue and dialogue uh moves the scenes but it's the in-between scenes that's all pantomime it's all him walking from place to place it's shots of him thinking about this or this or you know the fact that he writes his will that's done in complete silence. Yeah, okay. I, I can highlight those pieces, but I think the parts where this movie is at its strength core is all of the um, conversations that he has inevitably with everybody else. The one thing I'll say, and it's why, if anything, that I'm critical of this movie, 
I didn't think Gary Cooper was the right choice for this role. I know that's um, heretical, but I didn't think he played it that well. Um, you know, the, the Gary Cooper-esque nature, and it's commonly defined by the, the Tony Soprano line, um, the strong but silent type. Um, I, I don't get the same level of strength that other people do with him in this role. And to me, he seems to have um, the weird cliche of the quivering lip throughout the majority of the film. It's something he doesn't want to do. He's regretfully decided that it's the thing he has to do. And that ultimately um, he tries to find every way in which to either back out of it or uh, figure out a way of making the odds in his favor and he can't do it. But he eventually has to acquiesce. And even in saying that, I'm kind of talking myself more into him, which is weird that I'm kind of talking, <laughs> talking my way around the conversation. But ultimately, like, he did not leave a lasting impression. If there's anybody from this movie that uh, left a lasting impression, I think it has more to do with, um, you know, the, the writing, directing, and all the stuff surrounding the production as opposed to anybody particularly that was in it. Even the villain. Like the the normal antagonist is um, what, or you would say is normally Frank Miller. I would argue that the primary antagonist of this entire thing is um, Will Kane himself and time. Yes, and so that creates a much different dichotomy than the uh, normal old west of well, we got some bad guy and I gotta go out and face him and kill him. And that sort of like mentality that um, was pervasive. So I, I do think this is in a lot of ways, you know, I, I know a lot of people think that Unforgiven is the anti-Western or that it like um, w was the one that kind of uh, redid the genre for the more modern Western. But I, I think this is a much um, different and possibly um, better use of um, changing the genre and making it uh, credible or ma making it different, but not losing anything necessarily. Well, this film was different than a lot of the Westerns because it did kind of turn the typical formula on its ear. But I'm not certain, necessarily saying that it's for the better. Um, I'm... I have a lot of personal things about this movie that uh, I just don't in, I don't envision Gary Cooper as being heroic in this film. No. And and that's that's, that's the one place where like even his um strength in the end of it I I I I guess that might be the place that I was trying to get to and I may not have Gotten around well, to. And this is some of the things I've read about Howard Hawks and his opinion of this is, is that's exactly the same thing. They all, or Hawks actually thought, and I actually agree with him on this point, that the more heroic person in this entire film is Grace Kelly because she ultimately kills one of the villains, uh, even though she's a Quaker and opposes violence. But she does it to save her husband. Well, only at the urging, like she has to go through some level of a transformation of sorts, but only at the urging of Helen Ramirez. So, uh, all right. Uh, we forgot to get to the recognition portion of things. I should um, at least cover that, and then we'll move on to the next um, piece that we always do. But uh, recognition-wise, this was nominated for Best Picture in 1952. Uh, for director, um, for Fred Zinneman, screenplay for uh, Carl Foreman, uh, and it won Best Actor for Cooper, editing, original score, and song. It was one of the 25 original inductees into the first National Film Registry class. It appeared on the 1998 AFI Top 100 list at number 33. It was the 2001 um, number 20 entry at 100 Years, 100 Thrills. 2003's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains as Will Kane as the number five hero of all time. 
the 2004 AFI 100 Years 100 Songs for High Noon at number 25. The 2005 AFI 100 Years of Film Scores at number 10 all time. 2006 100 Years 100 Cheers at number 27. 2007 AFI's 100 Years 100 Movies 10th Anniversary Edition at number 27. 2008's AFI Top uh, 10 of 10 is the number two Western film of all time. So... Um, what is this movie about? And I think that's the central question that sets up the entire discussion of this movie. Uh, average guy put into a situation that he doesn't want to be in and ultimately has to act uh, when everybody else abandons him. So I've kind of already hinted at where I was going with this one, but it's an allegory. I, I think to a certain extent, and, and there's a reason why this movie was like Reagan's favorite movie of all time. And uh, it's constantly like the politician's favorite because they envision themselves to be the man standing alone for the lost cause um, who um, is standing up for right and justice, despite no one being there to help him. No, no, That's wrong, because ultimately this is an allegory uh, of uh, the McCarthyism and having your all of your friends abandon you and having to face the music alone. And that's what it was about. It's one of the reasons why John Wayne turned the film down, because John Wayne was a huge uh, asset to the House on on, uh, Un-American Activities. Uh, committee and championed removing communists from the uh, Actors Guild and was a big proponent of this. And one of the reasons he hated this movie was because he knew exactly what this film was supposed to be saying. And uh, Ronald Reagan notably provided information to the House um, Committee on Un-American Activities. So if Reagan said that it was his favorite film someplace, it's really a uh, he held 17 different screenings for other people of this at the White House. Well, then it's a uh, it is a uh, revisionist history aspect or something that he came to appreciate later on. But at the time, you know, because he was president of the Screen Actors Guild at the time that the uh, McCarthy hearings were going on. So they're not um, mutually exclusive things. Reagan could have provided things to HUAC and also appreciated this movie as an allegory for something else. Like this isn't, this isn't my necessarily like um, just raw opinion. This is stuff that has been done in college term papers forever on this movie. And uh, to just, out and out say that I'm wrong is flying in the face of a lot of other people's opinion, including my own, that while that may have been the thing, and I understand and commit the ability of um, the the historical context for you, and I would not only welcome, but say that, that you're probably correct, at least that was the intent, a lot of the things that come out of this film, and the way even I watch it is... Um, somebody who has to stand against um, an impending situation by himself when uh, everybody else just leaves. And because of that, it's usually for some type of lost cause. I mean, you, you think of all the ways in which everybody leaves him or makes an excuse or runs away or whatever else and does not come to his aid. Uh, and it's going to be one of my remaining questions, but simply put, like there are even insinuations that people were upset at him for cleaning up the town, which doesn't make any sense at all. So this, this is layered in a lot of situation and um, for, I mean, again, for basically the dialogue is only the first like hour, hour and five minutes. And then you have, the final sequence. 
um, which is the shootout. So if you take basically the first hour of the movie as a one or two act play and the morality of the situation and every excuse everybody gives for why they can't join in the fight or um, why they uh, are decidedly against it or any of the other things that are going to go on. And I think a lot of these are going to be um, hit on in either best scenes or best quotes. But um, I, I do think that's the majority of the film is, is it, you, you start to see other situations. It's comparable to a lot of other things uh, that people go through in their lives where um, they have a tough situation and they're standing for what they consider a lost cause. And ultimately everybody else is scared to do it uh, until they see somebody else do it. I mean, um, you could say that about a lot of different things uh, in uh, politics or history, et cetera. So I, I think I understand why some people see this as un-American because it's not heroic. And I can see where other people believe it's uh, exceptionally American because it's the notion of standing for the lost cause, which I, I think to some people is notably American. I'm not sure who, but... <laughs> I don't know. I, I all right. So let, let's get into the next portions of it. So, um, who was your best performer? Well, and this is one. I this is one where I have been racking my brain for days trying to pick one. I guess. I'll take the obvious and say Gary Cooper, but it's really hard because uh, <laughs> I really, you know, it's not like there's any performance that just goes, wow, to me. I think Gary Cooper is the notable one from this. For most people that watch the film, my best performer, however, is Fred Zinneman. I think this is a directorial masterclass and we've already talked about it in a lot of ways for the situation that uh of from the framing of shots to how the movie is done to uh the editing and everything in between and how uh everything works together i think this movie could very easily go off the rails or if you didn't have it as um clean and crisp or in it, the time frame that it that it uh ends up at you know if this movie is two hours i don't think this movie works uh if you add another scene of just random dialogue with him and another character i don't think it works if you don't have that um heavy set tone from the outset of yeah the musical background but even that's got kind of a uh pulse to it that um plays into um all of the uh pressure or emotional state that you're supposed to go through as you watch it i don't think this movie works so from all of those standpoints my best performer is fred zinneman okay so best minor performer I like Lloyd Bridges. Okay. I thought it was obvious to me when you're watching this that Lloyd Bridges had talent and had a stage presence um, that was going to be able to, you know, produce. I, you know, after having watched this and considered, it's to me it's a little odd that he never really became the the movie star that I thought he might be. Or could have been. He did a lot on television with Sea uh, Hunt and such, you know. <clears throat> but uh, he's a character that will definitely come up in a different movie that we're eventually going to cover. I just for the the part that he played, he's supposed to be playing kind of an insolent 
young guy, and I didn't seem to get that from him, even though, like, you understood where his character's supposed to go. You didn't get the the right cues. He seemed a little older than, I think, the character he was meant to play, and so it didn't quite work for me. I, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but... I don't know, maybe you should have quit sniffing glue a few weeks earlier. Come on, you're getting ahead of ourselves again. Um, all right, mine was uh, Carl Foreman, and it's simply because I would have felt remiss if we didn't um, give him some type of mention or something else. The writing of this movie and the idea and the premise and all of the things that go into it I think this is one of the best scripts that I can think of, at least for what we've done. There are other better achievements by some of the films that we've done or better premises or whatever else, but this, to me, plays out much more like a Shakespearean drama than any of the other films we've covered so far. Um, With maybe the exception of um taxi driver or uh, apocalypse now but i think those are much different films that explore different parts of the uh psychological element of um humanity but uh being from a, a theater background like we are um this just is always going to appeal to me in that sense and so um for that and the reason that he was blacklisted he was kind of run out of town, um, you know, and Wayne took very great pride in running him personally out of town, um, you know, and that being Hollywood. Um, I think he just needed to be recognized, and I have no problem as putting him as my best minor performer. Okay. Actually, he ended up having to flee to London and worked in British film for a while. Which is interesting. All right. So, who then is your most charismatic? Well, Grace Kelly. Yeah, that's who I had done, too. I found it notable that um, Hitchcock actually said this was probably one of her more unappealing performances. And if you didn't know it was Grace Kelly, I mean, she doesn't have quite the presence that she does in other movies uh, later on, um, notably in Hitchcock films. But I do think... Um, she still has that charisma that's always there, that movie star quality, even if it's not to the same degree in other ones that we've seen. Well, this is really her first film. He kind of, or they kind of found her, and I can't remember where, if she would have been in, in the theater or what, but you know, this was like her first major part. So she was still feeling her way around. Um, although it did start a string of films as well as other personal, uh, dalliances. So, uh, let's just move on to best scene then. Uh, and I will try and make sure that, uh, the overall podcast is actually less than the film itself. I don't think we've had trouble with that before, but I really don't want to start now. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I have a few different nominees, and you can add in any that you like that you think I missed. So number one, Kane is faced with a choice. Um, essentially, this takes place over kind of um, two different scenes, essentially. I will defer to the second one. The first being um, just after his wedding when he finds out the information. But the second one is the much more um, uh, highlighted one for me where he basically um uh, stops himself from leaving and takes on the choice of um trying to stay and fight it out uh because he feels that it's his um fight left to have so uh let's see here uh pell turns in his badge uh ultimately he's the first defector um the guy who is supposed to be the primary deputy in charge who 
really is only in it for his own satisfaction and glorification. And when he no longer can get that, has no incentive um, to continue the fight. And we all know people in this, again, this is where the allegory comes in, uh, but we all have had people like that where their only incentive is not for their the the greater good or anything else, but their own personal um, satisfaction. So I, I've, that being the first real defection and where the rest of the movie is going to go, it kind of sets in line with uh, the path we're going to continue down. Uh, number three, Kane visits the church. Um, ultimately, that's the biggest morality play. Uh, I chose this one as opposed to um, when he visits the bar or um, he visits a couple of his different friends just because of the setup of how things went. Um, the It comes out in the dialogue, and you'd miss it if you weren't really paying attention. Um, not that uh, Amy is a Quaker, but ultimately that um, why she's a Quaker and um, also why, um, you know, Kane has kind of thrown in with her that he was never a church going guy and he's now married a Quaker who obviously doesn't have the same, um, I guess, belief system as those that are attending the church. But it's uh, going to come back into um, the rest of the movie. And ultimately, that that by itself should not be the limiting factor, or at least from where he sees the limiting factor on whether or not um, the townspeople should uh, help him. And it sets off this kind of um, back and forth fight between all of the congregation as to whether they should contribute or not. Um, number four. Martin Howe declines Kane. This is where, like, your mentor, you go to him for strength, but he can no longer participate. And it, it's similar. So you were listening to, um, or not listening, but watching that um, uh, lecture series today with um, John Cleese, and you made comments of how, like, um, jaded and cynical he gets. And I immediately thought of, this character and this seems to be a lot of people that have fought the good fight you could say this is tommy lee jones's character and um <laughs> like ending sequence of no country for old men that you put in all of this hard work throughout your life um and ultimately you get a rusted tin star at the end of it and that's the only thing you have to show for a lifetime of fighting the good fight or the lost cause and so because of that, he's become jaded and cynical and um, doesn't want to get in the fight. And again, this is another one of those where we're highlighting this uh, morality distinction or why certain people are doing it. One by one by one, you get why no one is going to help him. And, you know, they all flee or they all do their own thing. So number four, and I think this kind of is a consequential scene as we've kind of hinted at already if we haven't outright said something but the meeting between amy and helen ramirez and it's going to come up in quotes uh, more specifically as i highlight certain things but i i just think that the ending sequence and where uh amy comes in in order to um cast aside her own belief system in nonviolence in order to help will in the end doesn't happen without um, the urging of Helen Ramirez and how prominent a role she has specifically to um, the interplay of this entire film. Uh, so I, I, I think if anything, as far as the two women, other than the situation where Amy actually um, participates in the shootout, I think this is probably the most consequential scene for both of them as um, uh, larger supporting characters. Um, Pell fights Kane. Um, this is kind of one of those where it comes to a head and um, Lloyd Bridges and Gary Cooper get into that fist fight in the barn. And again, this is another one that's going to come up in quotes um, that I have eventually, but uh, it's, it's 
well, I'll save it kind of more for the quotes section of things. I'll just highlight that um, there are a lot of things that kind of come out as to um, the motivations of the characters and how they um, intersparse. And then it boils over into um, a fight because this is maybe the one redeeming scene for Pell up until the point where they get into a fist fight because he's trying to get Cooper to move on and not have to fight it anymore and see the world maybe in the same um, self-aggrandizing sense. But um, he ultimately forgoes that for the um, greater good. Uh, and then finally, the last scene, the shootout. Okay. So is there any of those that I missed that you would highlight? Uh, the scene of uh, Keen in the bar asking for okay uh, deputies, and then the bartender says that Miller was a friend of a lot of the people in there, and a lot of people in the bar uh, thought th things worked better when Miller was here. Okay, any particular reason for nominating that one? Because I think it it kind of highlights the dichotomy of between um, the fact that not everybody uh, thought that uh, Will Keane's actions were a good thing, and and that still somewhat generally confuses me because I don't think, and I know we're not supposed to get a real great sense of who Frank Miller is or what he did or. Um, all of the other things he's kind of talked about as um, I don't know if the right word is monolithic figure um, that he's it's kind of in the same way that like um, certain shows. So Big Bang Theory talked about Howard's mom or Frasier um, talks about Maris or, you know, these people that are off screen that you build up such a a uh, particular character build of them, but they don't appear. The one exception being that Frank Miller does appear, but like other than the action sequences, he has uh, almost no lines. So all of it's just really to serve the purpose of the ending of the film uh, being the shootout. So I, I guess that's where I, the one place that if there were, there was some more clarity as to what this uh, was supposed to be that it might um, improve the film, but I also don't want to like you know have a whole five minute scene on who Frank Miller is in order to give us the exposition that we need. He's a MacGuffin. Yeah. Hitchcock okay. Says. All right. That's so that's a good matter. one. It doesn't matter what he is. It's who he is, which is, or I mean, you know, what he's done. It's a matter of he's the bad guy for whatever reason. And he's coming back for vengeance. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's that's his placeholder thing. And so that's what I mean. I, I don't need, you know, five minutes of dialogue on the, the life story of Frank Miller. You know, one or two throwaway lines that would clarify this would probably work. It's just one of those things where I think that that could have added just slightly more clarity if, if I'm going to nitpick. So, which of these, though, would you say is the best scene? Um, the best scene that I love is, uh, um, well, it was Gary Cooper and Lon Chaney Jr. You know, it's just the, the last hope that you have. The person that you thought you could rely on more than anybody else, and even they let you down. So, that's his mentor? Yes. Okay. So that was the character's name is Martin Howe. And yes. that's the one I ended up going with as well. Um, I think I would almost nominate it for favorite scene, but I think I'm going to go with the shootout just, you know, because it kind of caps or, um, Again, that's that's a linchpin scene where if that doesn't work, then the rest of it doesn't work either again. But that you could say that a lot of different things within this film because of um, the operating style. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's. 
that's the one where it sinks in and it's the toughest that he's really going to be essentially by himself. The one other or the lone exception would be that the one remaining deputy that he had that had committed to that, um, he eventually has to let go after that scene. But yeah. that's only because he doesn't want to help Kane by himself. He doesn't just want to be the two of them. Had it been a group of people, he would have gladly joined. But with it just being Will, um, you know, that that's something he's not willing to go for. So that would be the lone exception. But this is kind of the last um, desperate line of help. And to see... There was almost no one there. And so this yeah, was this a... this didn't make a ton of money. Yeah, this was a film that... Um, was the critics loved, the public was like, eh. And I, I really don't think it had a narrative that really transcend the film until much later. I think it became more popular for people watching it for the first time 10 or 15 years later than it did when it was released. And I find that to be the case of a lot of the movies that are going to end up on our film, that they get a second life. Uh, sometimes because they're maybe a little bit ahead of um, things that are to come. Um, I can see this in a few other um, war films to a certain extent. Like, I, the closest thing comparably, it's not the same war, but it, as far as pictures, I see a lot of influences from the Hurt Locker to this. Kind yes. of stripped down. Um, you get it in a very small... Uh, core of people. It's a different kind of movie, and it's a different war entirely, but there there are so many... It, it's almost documentary style, as opposed to um, like much more narrative versions that you get out of like World War II films, or like Saving Private Ryan, there's like this overarching um, piece, or a, a certain theme of it, as opposed to kind of what naturally comes about in the rawness. Well, you mentioned The Hurt Locker, and, and it, that's one of the things that early on attracted me to your mother when we were dating, was is all of a sudden she'll find something that really trips her trigger. And this was, a, or The Hurt Locker was a film that no one had talked about, I had not heard. She heard a piece on it on the radio and determined that we absolutely had to go. And we went to a matinee on a Saturday afternoon and watched The Hurt Locker. And I think there were maybe two or three other people in the theater when we watched it. And that's the same thought process. That this is a film that there was not a lot of people that really appreciated it or what it was trying to accomplish. So, so for novelty, I went with an eight. Oh, I suppose I should just back up a second. That our average score then came out to a five point seven five. Anyway, moving forward, I I put novelty at an eight, um, simply because the whole first act, and again, that's the part that sticks with me more than anything else. Yes, is nothing you're going to see in almost anything else. Correct. And from that standpoint alone, the authenticity that you get from uh, Ermi for kind of that happy accident we talked about, um, I think kind of makes this much more novel. Now, again, there are some pieces of this. There, Like his whole mantra, we only just burgeoned on it a little bit. And again, a disclaimer, but... The whole conversation, and then him going and asking specific soldiers uh, if they sucked dicks. Obviously, this movie, and uh, the time period it's explaining, is well ahead of the don't ask, don't tell policy, which was even um, problematic later on uh, itself and is now currently not in place. So, the army and times have significantly changed as far as that. This is the Marine Corps. Don't confuse them with the Army. You will ultimately okay. have yes. problems dealing with okay. many. You, that is an important distinction. I know there are quite a few... Um, we will not mention this to your brother-in-law. Yes. I, I know that Marines... 
Marines take are, themselves very, very Marines seriously. Marines are a 10. The Army is about a 7. The uh, Navy is about a 6. And the Air Force is about a 2 on the toughness scale. I'm not going to go into that. That's not my diagnosis. That's not mine. I'm just relating what I hear from a Marine. Okay. I'm I'm not even going to go here or there. But ultimately, though, I'll put this... um, The novelty aspects of it... um, I don't think it was a novel concept or a novel story... But they did something at least different, so I think it needs to be graded higher, so I gave it an 8. I also have it as an 8, and mine reasoning is not quite what yours is. My reasoning is is that every Vietnam story had a moral aspect to it. It had a principle of which it was trying to tell you. What you should feel, what you should think, how you should deal with this. This, to me, is the film that most rawly says, this is what really happened. You figure out how the fuck you want to believe or what you think about it. That's the way I am on this. And to that extent, I give it an 8. Okay. I I can definitely buy into that. Uh, Classicness, I think I've kind of already gone over a few of these points. Uh... I think being a period piece, uh, this is based on a book um, and the adaptation and the rest of it, I don't think there's anything that um, is necessarily out of place, but there are some, like like I mentioned, some kind of squirmy things that don't age well due to their (laughs) historical context. Not that they're necessarily inauthentic, but, um, yeah. And... The harshness of the military and, well, um, the Marines in this particular instance. But I have to imagine that it's still somewhat similar. Uh, it is and it isn't. I, I, I wouldn't know. I, I, we would, this would have been one to bring in uh, Keith for this particular episode. But I'll, I'll just give it an 8. I, I don't find too many glaring flaws. I don't think it's one where I can put it as highest marks because I don't think this is something that was ahead of its time because it's a period piece, but it ultimately doesn't have anything that's that's sticking out like a sore thumb. This film accurately reflects military attitudes, thoughts, and conduct. The problem in the history of military uh, behavior in general, as a student of military history, is that the military reflects the attitudes, thoughts, and beliefs from five years before. So when you're talking about the Civil War, where they now have rifles, they're still trying to get within uh, 50 yards of each other and when the guns they have are able to shoot accurately 100 to 120 yards. Uh, It's the same principle World War I. We're now having trench warfare, uh, which started in the Civil War, and we have to accommodate. It's the same situation here. The the Army integrated when uh, that was ordered by Truman in 48. It uh, had to happen in Korea. There was ramifications. It continued. By Vietnam, that ramification lessened. Now we have the Army, Marines, military in general, having to accommodate sexual orientation. This film is a relic of the pre-era of that, and it reflects that. So, to that extent... Seven. Okay, I think for an average of seven and point five, I uh, you know that that certainly um, is within the range. I, I, you know, I'm not gonna have one huge issue one way or the other. Now, 
again, our most subjective one. This is the one where I, I guess I felt the most strongly, and I, I really kind of came down on this number almost immediately after finishing the film. Three and a half. It's such a... Which category? Rewatchability. You didn't mention that, by the way. I thought I did, but okay. Oh, no. well, good catch. Um, but rewatchability, I had it a three and a half. This is such a difficult movie in stretches to watch. And I, I think that's the case for all of the... Like, honestly, the Deer Hunter platoon, uh, oh. Full Metal Jacket, uh, Apocalypse Now, um, none of those films is one where I'm, like, eagerly going back to watch. Um, or one that, like, I can rewatch multiple times. These have such a slog, um, difficult shock value nature to them that that's part of the effect and what they want you to pull out of this. So for that I'm not going to say it's unwatchable. I don't think there are um, issues with, again, this isn't the worst movie that I'm like objecting to watching but it's certainly not one that I'm going to put on uh, voluntarily, unless like there's a reason to put it on. Well, let's put it this way. I saw this movie 33 years ago. I am now 56. If I watch this movie again in 33 years, that'll be about right. So, at that point in time, I will be 89. That's well within the realm of what we should do. Um, <laughs> so, one and a half? Uh, I had 2.5 because, okay. um, you know, the fact is, is I give two to any film I would ever rewatch again, no matter what. But, you know, as being somebody that's a student military student, I've had, and for the audience, I have certain health issues that have existed since I was a child that basically precluded me from any kind of military service. But I also was in that era between uh, Vietnam and Reagan where I was becoming a young adult and, you know, on and on and on. So I have great respect for military service and for those who have sacrificed whether time, um, emotion, or life. Um, but I also am greatly pleased by the fact that I did not serve and have to go endure some of that stuff. So to that extent, I have great respect for it and understand, I think, as much as I can from having not been through it. But this is not a film that, if it's on next week, I'm going to go, hey, let's watch Full Metal Jacket. No. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a while unless there's, again, a reason to see it. Um... It's certainly not one I'm I'm going back to. Um, so with the uh, audience score, uh, a 94% for a 9.4, um, added to our rest of our total, that comes out to 40.65, and number 24 on our current list of uh, 27 films. So It's about right. Well, I don't know. I would have thought maybe a little bit higher, but it's hard to judge... But you have to understand. Some of these films are. I mean, we're not putting uh, on our list Caddyshack Two, and we're not putting. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Okay. Uh, so the fact is, is that we're rating the best. So even being on our list, if you're number twenty-seven, you're better than probably eight thousand films that have been released. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like, frankly, in order to get on this list, you have to have had some level of notoriety to begin with or, like, have some level of audience or following I'm, or yes, this legacy is, this, value. This is not beer fest. Okay, now. Now you're hitting a little below the belt. Yeah. It's okay to love really ridiculously stupid movies like Dude, Where's My Car? Yes, that it is. not going to be covering uh, for this. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Sweet. Dude, what does mine say? Sweet. 
the only remaining question I really only had, um, I mean, I'm not going to nitpick this thing, but uh, is just kind of how Pyle got all of, got the full magazine and the rifle into the bathroom without anyone noticing until the middle of the night. But again, that's, you're kind of going past the point. Really? You know, I'm shocked, all right? I have now, I, I just last week had my 31st, 32nd anniversary. Okay, so I have been sleeping with the same woman for 32 years. Okay, I am sleep next to her. And I am amazed about the fact that if I have insomnia, which I tend to do, I can get up in the middle of the night, go out in the living room, sit and read for an hour to try to get sleepy to come back to bed, go to bed, fall asleep, get up in the morning, and she has no idea that I had been up. Okay? So the fact that he can get up with a full metal jacket and go to the bathroom is not out of the realm of possibility. We're talking about men who have been running 15 miles in boots, who have been, you know, crawling through an obstacle course. They're exhausted. The fact that they're sleeping soundly, whatever. That does, that's the least, uh, important aspect of this film that I saw. Again, it was just a remaining question. Okay, well, I think I've resolved that. Uh, no. But, okay. I'm not going to nitpick it, because there was also the guard watch. Okay. You, your, your point had nothing to do with any of that, so... Any other remaining thoughts or questions you had on the, on the movie? Um... Now, one thing I would point out is is that the uh, the scene that really culminates the film ultimately, you know, Joker throughout the film is a little above the normal aspect of what the Marine Corps expects and wants. You know, he's kind of like making jokes, making light of this, never taking anything too seriously. And ultimately, the last real major scene is the sniper and the fact that she's pleading, you know, because she's dying, but it's a slow agonizing death asking for, pleading with them to just kill her to put her out of her misery and Joker's the one who ultimately is the the person who takes the gun and kills her. That, to me... Well, and then they top it off with the Mickey Mouse march. Yes. That, to me, is the ultimate dichotomy about war. Which is, you ultimately are committing both a humanitarian act and the most horrendous act you could ever commit as a human. Well, that's a great place to kind of end for the week. Uh, I uh, wish we could talk longer, but I'm expecting a friend for dinner. Um, please um, subscribe to the podcast so you can get uh, every episode that we do in your feed. Like I said, there will be two uh, coming up next week, um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, listen to those and get those in your feed. Uh, I'd like to... Um, once again recommend Podcast Town if you're a fellow podcaster and um, want a community to try and learn or if you're thinking about starting one of your own, uh, it's a great opportunity to um, get in contact with fellow podcasters, get a lot of information um, help with the production of it and it, it uh, really is um, of uh, significant value I'm a founding member of the community and um, the, the amount of things that I've learned this uh, week's episode would not be possible without them. So uh, I'll also add our new music is from Purple Planet um, which is a, a what is it? License free 
uh, domain uh, where you can pull um, places from it. So if you're thinking about starting it, but that's a, something I got from a suggestion from one of my fellow founding members. So um, this uh, episode was written, produced, and edited by me, Tom Duncan. And we look forward to seeing you next week uh, for uh, our uh, back episodes. Uh, thanks and have a great week, everybody.